It's a pleasure to talk to you today. My name's Chris Rowe. I'm with Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, and I'm joined by my colleague, Tim Williams, who's the Deputy Director of Argonne's Computational Science Division. And we're going to talk to you today about Argonne's upcoming Exascale system, Aurora. So in the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk about the hardware of Aurora. I'll give a brief overview, and then I'll talk about the compute, the network, the storage. In the second half, uh, Tim will talk about software programming models, tools, and the different development platforms, and how you can get support. All right, well, Aurora is going to be Argonne's first exascale supercomputing system. Um, we're pretty excited about this. It will have a sustained performance of greater than one exaflop. The compute is all Intel uh, uh, CPUs and GPUs. So we will have Intel Xeon Sapphire Rapid CPUs, and we're really excited that we're going to have Intel's Ponte Vecchio GPUs, which will be their up upcoming high-performance data center GPUs that they're developing now. The total system memory will be more than uh, 10 petabytes. The system's also developed in collaboration with Cray, and so Cray will provide the Shasta cabinets and also their new Slingshot uh, network. One of the sort of gems of Aurora is the new data synchronous, uh, asynchronous object storage, or DAOS. It will have greater than 230 petabytes in total capacity and a bandwidth of greater than 25 terabytes a second. And we'll also have more traditional Lustre storage with 150 petabytes of capacity and one terabyte per second. And the system will arrive at Argon in 2021. So this is a broad overview, but I'll dive into these different topics in the next few slides. While it might seem like uh, Intel's making a new foray into the um, GPU market, they've actually been developing GPUs for a number of years. Maybe you, we don't think about them quite the same way as, as some of the other vendors, but they, they've been in integrated into laptops and desktops and servers, and they were based on you know the target markets that they were after at the time. Um, so currently, you know, we've seen up to the Gen 9 and Gen 11 Intel integrated GPUs, but for Aurora, we will have the brand new Intel XE discrete GPUs, and we'll have their high performance uh, data center optimized ones that you can see here. There'll be a whole spectrum of them for the broader computing market. So the current generations of Intel integrated GPUs are the Gen 9. Uh, which is included with their Skylake processors, and Gen 11, which is integrated with their Ice Lake processors. You might have one of these in your laptop. So Gen 9 is peak double precision performance of, of around 100 to 300 gigaflops for most practical applications. By comparison to many of the discrete GPUs on the market, this doesn't sound that powerful, but you know, Gen 9 was low power by design because it was meant to be integrated graphics. The upcoming XE line of discrete GPUs from Intel, again, will be high performance data center oriented GPUs, which will compete with many of the other vendors in the market. The cabinets for Aurora are going to be Cray's new Shasta system, it supports a diversity of processors, and there will be two kinds of racks in Aurora. So the optimized or compute racks are designed to have high density cooling and also um, high network bandwidth. The standard cabinets are there to provide flexibility. You know, Cray's worked a lot on their software stack as well to Im improve modularity. And all of the cabinets will be connected by a single high performance network that I will talk about on, on the next couple slides. Slingshot builds on Cray's longstanding track record in, in, in HPC. So you might be familiar with systems like Titan or Blue Waters, which was the Gemini architecture or you may have used Theta or Cori or, or similar systems, which is the Ares architecture. If, if you're familiar with Ares, it has a what's called a five-hop dragonfly topology. So the new Slingshot network will have a three-hop dragonfly topology. It also introduces congestion management and traffic classes. What, what's the dragonfly topology? Well, a set of you know 512 nodes form a group, which is then connected into the network in an all-to-all -all fashion, which is very nice for many science applications. Because each switch has a good view of the overall state of the network, it can be make fast and well-informed decisions about which uh, optimal paths each data packet should take. 
and, and follow through the architecture and also make automatic adjustments to around any congestion. So on uh, you know, previous generations of systems, you know, depending on what other users are on the system and what kind of science applications they're running, maybe this could have affected your science application adversely, but the congestion management on the uh, Slingshot network will help to alleviate this. The, the network can also optimally preserve packet ordering while adapting the routes and even packet to adapt separately. In addition to the network switches, the Craze introduced the Rosetta high bandwidth switch. You know, this takes care of the multi-level congestion management and has very low average and tail latency, which is important for certain applications. The other concept that it introduces is quality of service, and this is how the traffic classes are implemented. So you can think of a traffic class as being a collection of buffers, queues, and bandwidth. And, and like we said, it has adaptive, aggressive adaptive routing, which will be, you know, very good for handling diverse workloads. And as we mentioned before, the, the bandwidth for this switch will be 25 uh, terabytes per second. Just to preface the, the next slide, there's something called the GPC net, which is the Global Performance and Congestion Network Test, which is a, a new benchmark developed by Cray in collaboration with Argon and NERSC. This benchmarking software is available on GitHub. Uh, so you can download it yourself. And so the goals of this benchmark are to be proxy for you know, real world science and engineering application communication patterns, to measure the network performance under realistic loads, to look at both the mean and tail latency, to look at the interface between different workloads, and to see how well the system performs under congestion. So you know, to basically you know, give, give the system a, a solid workout under realistic conditions, not just in you know, sort of green pasture conditions. To demonstrate the effectiveness of the new slingshot architecture, Cray used the GPC net benchmark suite. The tail latency was measured when the network was congested and also in isolation. And the benchmark was run over the full machine for multiple runs. And the congestion impact metric was defined as the ratio of the congested latency and the isolated latency. So we have here some results for different systems that you may or may not be familiar with. On Ares, which is you know sort of the the best previous generation of interconnect, the congestion impact is on the order of, of a thousand for the benchmark. InfiniBand reduced the congestion impact slightly, but you can see on the very end, or maybe you can't see, we have a green arrow there, that on Melback, which is has platform that Cray has, that the congestion was minimized greatly compared to these other systems. So this is very exciting. Uh, for you know the very science workloads that we, we see nowadays. So I'm, I'm sure that this will help many users out. We mentioned the different traffic classes, Cray's providing highly tunable quality of service classes. It supports multiple overlaid virtual networks. Jobs will be able to use multiple traffic classes. And it also provides performance isolations for different kinds of traffic. The individual user may or may not have access to all of these features, but ultimately the applications will still benefit from them. All right, well, we talked about the compute and the network. So, um, you know, the last part of the beast is the storage. And I think this is really one of the, the exciting and, and kind of like under, understated features for Aurora. So you may have or may not have heard of Deos, which is de distributed asynchronous object storage. So this is a new open source storage solution. It's very, very fast. It offers high performance in both bandwidth and in terms of IO operations. So, Aurora's total DAO storage will be greater than 230 petabytes, and it will have a bandwidth of 25 terabytes per second, which is uh, pretty incredible. Um, so using DAOs is uh, really important for achieving optimal performance on Aurora. I know application developers that I've talked to, everybody's really excited about you know, doing these giant runs in Aurora, but they're sort of maybe not always conscious of just how much more data they're gonna produce than on a previous system. I think it's important that we have this high performance uh, storage Importantly, it will also provide compatibility with existing IO models. So if you're using POSIX or MPIO or HDF5 or, or, or similar libraries, you'll be able to you know, seamlessly use DAOs without having to get into the really nitty gritty details yourself necessarily. It also provides a flexible API so that as new IO paradigms and models come along that uh, you know, we can interface with those seamlessly. In terms of the user environment, you know, the user will see a single storage namespace. It's compatible with, you know, legacy Lustre systems, and there will be links that point to the Deos containers within each science team's project directory. 
Um, and the DS software will you know, automatically in interpret these links to access the DS containers. Your data will reside in a single place, either in the Lustre or DS, and you'll have to do explicit data movement. There's no auto migration. And so the sort of suggested you know, use case that most users will see will be to store things like their source code and their binaries on the Lustre system, which is the, the slower of the two systems, and then to store their bulk data in Deos, which is kind of the uh, Formula One car, I guess, of, of uh, storage systems. And there will be you know, tools to help facilitate uh, copying back and forth between the two. All right, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the, the Gen 9 architecture, but there's a lot of information online that you can find about this and also on the JLC wiki. And maybe one, one important point to add to this, is, uh, like we mentioned earlier, is the sort of expected peak double precision performance for Gen 9 is around 330 gigaflops. So this is something to keep in mind whenever you're testing out your application on Gen 9. All right, so I will leave this up uh, as a quick summary. So, you know, we're excited to have our first exascale machine Aurora in 2021. It will have, you know, Intel Xeon Sapphire Rapid CPUs and Intel's new discrete XC Ponte Vecchio GPUs. It will have Cray's latest generation of Slingshot Interconnect, and we'll have highly tunable congestion management and traffic classes. And you know, we're really excited to have you know this very fast Deos storage as well as a more traditional Lustre system. So at this point, I will turn it over to Tim, and he will talk to you about the Aurora software stack. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so this is Tim speaking now. And I will talk a bit about, in this section of the talk, about the software and programming the Aurora system. As you may know, the mission of the LCF has evolved in recent years. And looking toward Aurora, our mission is to support not only traditional simulation-based HPC, but also to support data-intensive computing and machine learning, deep learning applications as equal peers, the so-called three pillars. So each of these pillars brings with them their own particular software needs. Um, for example, productivity languages like Python for data science applications. Uh, and they all, of course, rely on a substructure of mathematical libraries and compilers and I.O. So these particular software components, such as deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, will be part of the software on Aurora, optimized for the architecture, as well as traditional optimizing compilers. So how do you program the system? Aurora will have a number of available programming models. You can use OpenMP5 to target offloading of code onto the GPUs. You can use DPC++ or Sickle, OpenCL, or either of the ECP high-level programming models, Cocos or Raja. So if you already have an application that has been implemented for accelerator-based architectures like GPUs, uh, you may have some choices to make. For example, if you have been working on NVIDIA platforms and you've implemented your application in CUDA, then to move it to Aurora, you'll need to either transliterate that application to use DPC++ or Sickle, which I'll talk more about later, or you might consider using OpenCL. You know, CUDA itself will not be directly supported on the system. Those of you who have already started using OpenMP with target directives as a performance portable programming approach can just continue doing that on Aurora. And those of you who have adopted some of these high-level approaches should be able to just uh, run your code unchanged on Aurora. And with all of these, the traditional MPI will be used for internode parallelism. So Aurora will support a very large subset of the OpenMP5 standard. This has a number of advantages as a choice for a programming model. Chief among them is portability. The model will be supported for 
optimized programming of all of the known upcoming exascale platforms and pre-exascale platforms and will be highly optimized for the Aurora system. Uh, some of you may have come from an NVIDIA platform and used another directives-based programming approach, OpenACC. Uh, those will need to be converted into OpenMP directives. And uh, to the extent that we can, LCF will assist you with advice on uh, conversion of OpenACC into OpenMP. And there are some uh, potential automated or semi-automated tools that can help with that. The, ba the basic components of OpenMP5, most of which were already present in OpenMP4.5 <clears throat> that apply to a GPU accelerated system like Aurora are uh, first and foremost offloading proper using the target directive. Uh, how you distribute that parallelism onto the accelerator through the use of teams, for example. And of course, associated with this are directives to control transfer of data to and from the GPU, to and from the CPU. The, the directives indicated here with asterisks are new in OpenMP5, and these include some things like the, the o, Pragma OMP loop, which is a, a, a convenient mechanism for doing some of this stuff. Another programming approach for Aurora um, coming out of Intel's work is what Intel calls DPC++ or Data Parallel C++. This is built on top of something called SICL. Uh, SICL has been around for a while. It's a standard, standardized by a multi-organization consortium called Kronos. And what it is is a C++-based abstraction layer that builds on top of concepts from the lower level OpenCL approach to programming accelerators. It uh, has advantages that it is uh, less verbose than programming directly in OpenCL, as well as being as close as possible to standard C++. And there are a number of current implementations of SICL out there that have been out there for a while. You can see some of them listed here. You can, you can download these and try them out. Sickle runs on uh, CPUs and also on a variety of present day GPU systems. DPC++ extends Sickle. It's part of Intel's One API specification, which I'll talk more about later. It is providing a number of important extensions such as uniform shared memory, reduction operations in a nice bundled way and subgroups. It's also worth mentioning that there has recently been a development by CodePlay, which is an implementation of DPC++ directly onto the NVIDIA hardware. The back end of that is CUDA. And so this is something that you can try out today on NVIDIA systems and gives an indication that if you develop in DPC++, you can be portable to more than just Intel GPU. I won't say much about OpenCL, except to mention that it is available on Aurora. If you already have existing OpenCL programs, you will be able to run those on Aurora. If, if you were thinking about this, you might consider instead using DPC++ or SICL as a slightly higher level approach, which will not ultimately be dependent upon having OpenCL as an implementation. We'll have two versions of MPI on the Aurora system. One from Cray, which will be of course optimized for the Slingshot network, and another from Intel, which is coming out of a multi-year collaboration between the MPitch team at Argon and Intel. Both of them will be implemented at the lowest level on LibFabric, which is the fundamental close to the metal programming layer for the Slingshot network. So you may have heard about One API. So I just wanted to say a few words on what this is for orientation with respect to programming Aurora. So One API is both 
a standard specification from Intel and also a bundle of products, uh, programming libraries, compilers, and toolkits that Intel is providing and which we will have on Aurora. It includes DPC++, Intel's extended variant on Sickle. For programming languages, uh, Aurora will have the usual suspects, C and C++, um, and Fortran, um, all supporting OpenMP5 offload. It will also have the DPC++ language uh, we've talked about, and, and it will also have support for Python with optimized uh, libraries and other mechanisms for GPU offload. The Intel Fortran compiler, as is the case with the other compilers, is a new development from Intel um, based on an LLVM backend. And th those of you who have used Intel Fortran in the past know that they have a strong history of highly optimizing Fortran compilers. So we look forward to that with Aurora. The public beta of this is expected to be available in the second half of 2020. And I'll talk more about that and more generally about the One API public beta and accessing it a little later in the talk. But first, let's talk a bit about other programming tools and libraries for the Aurora system. Uh, as you might expect, um, Intel's familiar VTune and advisor tools for performance measurement and performance understanding and performance projection, respectively, uh, will, will be a part of the Aurora programming toolkit. Um, VTune will give you and already can give you today on Intel integrated GPUs like the Gen 9 uh, details about performance of offloaded code on the GPUs. Advisor um, will provide the ability to do things like roof automated roofline analysis and identifying which kernels in an application that you can run on a CPU system today, running it, running it under advisor, would potentially benefit from offload to Intel GPUs and by how much it might benefit. Intel's math kernel library is being revised and there are already beta versions of it to support optimized offloading of algorithms to Intel GPUs. Uh, so this includes everything that you're familiar with in the MKL library from the CPU world, uh, FFTs, linear algebra, etc. Under the One API branding, MKL will become One MKL. It's important to note here that uh, support for use of MKL and other Intel libraries from DPC++ is part of the new ecosystem. For those of you working in data science areas, uh, Intel has its own lower level libraries for implementation of higher level frameworks such as TensorFlow. Uh, an example of that is the data analytics library, uh, formerly known as DAL and now known as OneDAL. This is uh, classic machine learning algorithms uh, and a few other things like that. It also has the One DNN library, formerly known as MKL DNN, as well as uh, you know major components from the big data stack. As Chris mentioned, uh, the I/O system on Aurora is this distributed asynchronous object store. Um, from an application programmer's perspective, uh, points of interest include that Deus is designed to be fast for a wide variety of different read and write patterns. Everything from single file per rank to single file per application and all kinds of things in between. When you, if your application is written in terms of standard middleware, such as HDF5 or MPI-IO or POSIX-IO, you need not change your application to take advantage of Deos. The, all of these um, common middleware layers will be implemented 
in an optimized way atop the Deos interface itself. So what can you do now to uh, try programming toward Aurora? As I mentioned, Intel has packaged up the uh, tools and libraries that will be used to program Aurora under its one API branding. Um, if you would like to try it out today, you can do so via Intel's dev cloud systems on the web, uh, where you can very easily get an account, uh, log in, build things like DPC++ or OpenMP offload applications and try them on their, their cloud systems, which are uh, Xeons with uh, Gen 9 integrated graphics, for example. You can also put together your own system to do this kind of development today. Uh, any system with Intel Gen 9 graphics, such as an Intel Nuke system, um, will work, and you can download Intel's public beta of the One API programming toolkit. If you want to learn more about uh, programming Aurora, we have an evolving set of documentation on the LCF website, as well as a series of webinars we're presenting on different topics relevant to developers looking to use Aurora in the future. Thank you.